Hello and welcome back to the Home Studio Simplified channel. I'm your host, Robert McClellan. Today we are continuing on with our video series, Creating a Song Step by Step. If you have not viewed videos one through three, there will be a small ticker at the top right hand corner of your screen now that will lead you to a playlist that contains those videos and you can watch them all in succinct order to get the most out of this series. Likewise, to get the most out of this particular video, it would be very beneficial for you to listen on either earbuds, headphones, or studio monitors so that you can really catch and grasp what I'm trying to show you in this particular video. But before we even move on to the, the mix and where it's at right now, let's talk a little bit about the Threadless Shop because I have new shirts available. Fader Finagler, Mixing Ninja is now available. And all of these can be purchased at a reduced price due to Black Friday sales, which will go on until December 12th, I believe. You can also get free shipping with a code that I will include in the description of this video. So go ahead and pick yourself up a mug or a notebook or anything that you would find there. It will just help to support the channel and you'll get a cool piece of merchandise out of it. All right, moving on to the mix and where it stands now. So in the last video, which was video three, we talked about the production elements of this mix up until this point. Where to add things, where to take things away. And you'll notice on my screen now I have all of these tracks are frozen. What this does is it takes MIDI tracks, creates them into audio tracks. It takes all of your timing, all of your uh, adjustments that you've made as far as where things go and just simply mixes them down. So this is sort of like a real quick mix down. It gives you a better representation of things without all the choppy edits that you've made. Now at any point when I unfreeze these tracks, it'll go right back to the, the way that it was before, but by freezing all of these tracks, it frees up a whole lot of space on your RAM, and it helps your session to move a lot quicker, especially when you're running a third-party program like I am right now to stream this. So let's dive right into what we're going to talk about now that I've given you sort of some of the groundwork as to why this looks the way that it does and you also know to be listening on headphones and here's the reason why so there's going to be a loud noise now so up until this point this is what we've been listening to now listen to this Something very simple, but that's what we're going to talk about today. So up until this point, every video that you've watched or followed along with me on, no one's ever called it out. I was kind of waiting for it, but no one has called it out as of yet, but everything was done in mono. So today's mixing tip that I'm going to give you on creating a song step by step is to begin doing everything in mono. Now, in the previous video, when I talked about layering these guitars, I had already panned them hard left and hard right. And even then, I thought, well, this is going to be where someone's definitely going to pick up on this because they're going to say, dude, I, I seen you pan it, but I, I heard nothing happen. The reason being is because nothing will happen if you're in mono. And that's the beauty of mixing or at least preparing most of your tracks in mono. Let me talk about some of the points as to why we would even do this. Okay, so point number one, when you're working in mono, it's much easier to address phase issues because you're just going to hear them better. In one of the first videos, I believe it was video two, yeah, I think it was video three, that we talked about the phase issues. We, we looked at the peaks and the valleys of waveforms and we saw that some of them were actually fighting against each other, which causes what's called phase issues. Now, when those fight against each other, you have a really degraded sound. It just doesn't sound natural. It sounds wonky. There's all kinds of descriptive terms for what it sounds like, but it doesn't sound good, and that's for sure. Whenever you're in mono, however, you're able to actually pick up on and hear that sound that you normally couldn't hear if it was in stereo, or at least you could hear it, but it wouldn't be quite as dramatic in your ears. However, by putting it in mono, it's almost like a given. You can hear it right off the bat. So 
In order to get a best representation as you're building your song out, you can catch these beforehand and then you don't have to search through a densely populated mix to find things to fix. This is all about creating a song step by step and doing it with purpose and doing it in an order that makes sense and doing it in a way to where you're going to have the best end result at the end of when it's all said and done. So after addressing those phase issues, another beautiful point of mixing in mono is the fact that it forces you to think to yourself, okay, what is at this particular portion of the song, what is the thing that needs to stand out the most? What is the, the star of the show in this particular portion of the song? However, everything else needs to kind of fit cohesively to one to, into one another, like a, a puzzle piece. And so that's where we talked about these phase issues when they're not fitting together like a puzzle piece, they battle one another. So when you're listening in mono, you not only have to deal with the phase, but now you get to hear also frequency cancellations. And this is where we get down to sort of the microscopic level of things when we start talking about frequencies, because frequencies, when they're battling each other, isn't always as noticeable as phase. Phase is kind of like you hear an audible sound, and it just sounds like it's maybe recorded in a hallway or a bathroom or something, and you're like, oh, that's, that's a phase issue. However, with frequency issues that are battling one another, it's not always as easy to hear them. However, when you're in mono, it's a lot easier to hear what's not poking through. And so, for instance, on these guitars right here, now in order to make uh, adjustments on these, I actually have to take the freeze off. Otherwise, the adjustments that I make, you won't hear anything. So let's go ahead and take a listen to these in solo. And we'll talk a little bit more about this frequency cancellation. Okay, so I'm going to fold this back down to mono. Okay, so with it in mono, let's take a look at our console view real quickly here. There's one area here where it's actually boosted at 1262 and another area where it is cut at 1262. So in order to get frequencies to play well together, you have to create space for those frequencies. Now, this is where we can go kind of overboard too. And this is where I want to talk about making small, minute mixing ninja tricks, okay? You don't want to do these these crazy swooping movements all over the place because what happens is, um, well, let's take bass frequencies for instance. Bass waves, um, even when displayed on the screen, are a lot larger because it's a bass frequency. It has uh, it takes up a lot more space. So one of the biggest problems with muddy, muddy mixes is the fact that people haven't taken care of their bass frequencies and carved out room for them to set nicely. Like say, for instance, on these particular guitars, there's not really a need for them to go anything below 126 hertz. Reason being is because there's nothing, there's no information that's even needful for the mix below that point. So by cutting all the way up and to that point, as you can see here, what I've done is essentially I've carved out this much space for the bass frequencies to set. Now if I left that in there, there might be bass frequencies in these guitars that are inaudible or even audible that just don't benefit the mix whatsoever. However, when they stack on top of those large waveforms of other bass frequencies, they begin to compile upon one another. And so you get this vicious cycle of bass frequencies flying all over the place, taking over the mix. And now you have a, a, a monster on your hands and you don't know where it's all coming from or how to take care of it. So right off the bat, I know by listening to these, I don't need anything below that point because these are not bass heavy. These are not, these guitars are not going to be, um, my bass carrying my bass frequencies. Now, there's still some in there, enough to make them sound natural, but not so much to make them sound like they're trying to take over the mix with the rest of the bass. That being said, when it comes to making movements within a mix, you have to work in small increments. Now, scientifically, it's been proven that 3 dBs is the point at which your ear will actually begin to pick up on changes in audio. Anything below that is almost insignificant. Your ear doesn't really catch on to it. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about these. I've got them folded down to mono. 
I'm going to take this 1262 down to zero, which is where it was at to begin with. And let's just listen to it like that. So as it stands, that doesn't sound bad. However, it sounds almost just like one guitar, and that's a recording of two separate guitars. So essentially, just like we did with the phase cancellation, where we flipped phase and we got those uh, peaks and valleys to play well together, we're going to do the same thing here with EQ. It's all like trying to fit a jigsaw puzzle together, or a big group of people together and trying to get them to all work together cohesively. Sometimes you have to say, okay, this person has a strength in this area, so I'm going to boost that 3 dBs. And this person, it sounds good, but it's not necessarily adding to anything that they do, so they're better in other areas. I'm going to actually take away 3 dBs from that area and allow them to carve out a spot. So now when these are laid on top of each other and they have this carving out for one another they're going to fit together better like the jigsaw puzzle so let's go ahead and take that back and I'm going to make the adjustment while it's playing Okay, yet again, very subtle, not a, not a huge deal right now, but listen to the difference that it makes whenever it's brought back out into stereo. Now personally, in mono, I could hear that it seemed to clear itself up. I was actually able to tell that there were two guitars, just simply because they sounded a little different now. Okay, so I'm going to undo those changes in stereo. It should be a lot more noticeable. Okay, so if, yet again, if you were listening on headphones, what you should have picked up on is for one, it sounded like there was a little bit more clarity that was added, and for two, this is an added benefit of this, because they're panned hard right and hard left, it actually added just a touch more stereo width. And the reason being is because your ears are not perceiving them as the same sounds or close to the same sounds any longer. Because you've added that variation, that little bit of a difference, it's actually helped it to grow wider. So one of the secrets to wider mixes is actually not throwing on um, a stereo width plug-in or doing some kind of crazy mid-side processing at first, but one of the secrets is just to carve out frequency areas like this and to make sure that whatever you're recording on both sides, and you should be double tracking if you want stereo width, whatever you're double tracking, make sure that they sound completely different. So, for instance, on the right hand side, you'll notice I have a picture of a telly, and that's because I played a telly. On the left hand side, you'll notice I have a picture of a strat, that's because I played a strat. By just getting those two different sonic soundscapes together, immediately it sounded wider from the get go. Had I played the same guitar on the same pickup so selection, at the same volume, at the same yada yada yada, it still would have sounded wide in the sense that it was double tracked and they're not going to be completely uh, flawless representations of the first recorded track. However, it's not going to be as wide as if I created a whole new sonic soundscape on the left hand side. Alright guys, so in this video we've talked about mixing in mono. We have talked about frequency cancellation as opposed to phase cancellation. We've also talked about uh, making sure that we are making small changes to our mix, 3 dBs or less, unless 
the track requires it. And we've also talked about making sure that whatever we're recording, if we're double tracking it, which we should be, that we are trying to use different instruments or at least different effects on one side versus the other. So by doing all of these things, you're setting yourself up for a better mix in the end, something that's gonna not only be easier to mix, but that it's gonna sound better as well. Now, one of the last things that I wanna talk about is the dim solo button. This little button right here is really useful whenever you're mixing especially because I've said it time and time again and I'll say it one more time the lead vocals they are the only instrument quote unquote that you can actually solo and do all of your EQ adjustments compression things and all of that and bring it back into a mix and it's fine because your vocal sort of is an entity unto itself it's the star of the show unless it's like an EDM or something like that but it always wants to be up front, it's always got to be present, and you want to carve it out to where it sets in its own space, generally speaking, anyway. Now, it has to be cohesive and, and sound like it's part of the mix at the same time, but it's one of the only instruments, like I said, that you can actually solo to do your mixing movements on and still have uh, a good representation of what you're doing and whether it's helping the mix or hindering it. Now others, however, because they're extra added elements and they're all supposed to play well together and they're all supposed to be cohesive and they all need balance, that's where the dim solo mode comes in. Because without dim solo mode, if I'm playing this track, and I go, oh, I don't like the way this guitar sounds right here. I want to crank it up. I want to do this. I want to adjust this bring it back into the mix, now it doesn't sound as good or it sounds different and it's making me go, well, wait a minute, maybe it was this guitar. And before you know it, you're bouncing all over the place trying to figure out how to get balance and where to get balance and you've done so many different moves in so many different places, it's hard to even keep track. However, with dim solo mode on, now I can play back this in the solo. And what it does is it completely turns down the entire mix a negative 6 dBs just under whatever I'm working on. So now if I solo this, I'm going to hear this guitar at its original level and everything around it at minus 6 dBs, which is going to give me a better representation of the moves that I'm making while I'm making them in context with the mix. All right, guys, so this video was more explanatory than it was exploratory. It was more um, sort of talking about what to do than actually showing you what to do. In the next video, video five we're going to talk more about getting into what we did to eq things we're going to talk more about what we did to make things uh, fit together and we're going to even talk more about more production elements that have been added and i've got some ideas for some other things that i'd like to throw in here and then we're going to get to a point where we can actually start to get this song shaped into something that can be radio ready uh, in, a, in a fully mixed form. So if you have found these videos helpful, please go ahead and subscribe now and hit that bell icon so that whenever I upload a video, you'll be the first to know. Make sure that you leave comments below of any questions that you might have, if there's something that you would like for me to cover, if there's a shirt design that you'd like for me to implement into the store, if there's just some kind of, I don't know, anything, just drop it down below and let me know. And be sure to share this with your friends as well, especially if they're new into mixing. I also have an entire playlist on this channel of Cakewalk Tutorials. If you have not downloaded Cakewalk by BandLab, it is free. I would definitely recommend that you go and do that. They're not paying me to say this. It's a program that I've used for over 20 years. Absolutely love it, and I know that you will too. So until next time, guys, I'll talk to you all later. You have a blessed day.